April, you were the first person, one of the first people that I thought of when we decided to put together this series, because one of the early pain points that I saw with a lot of folks as we kind of transition into this weird nebulous elastic pants waist hang out at home um, situation yeah. is that the original messaging that people were using to discuss their products and offerings overnight stopped making sense. Um, right. And for those of you who don't know April, she's an absolutely brilliant positioning expert. Um, so a lot of people ask me, when I say positioning expert, what does that actually mean? How do you describe positioning? Yeah, yeah I'm, the, I'm the positioning expert, so everybody asks me that. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually worse when they don't ask me because positioning is so misunderstood that generally when, when people don't ask me the question, I know they have an idea in their mind and we may disagree on the definition of what that is. So. So here's how I define positioning. So your positioning, in essence, defines how your offering is the best in the world at providing something that a well-defined set of customers cares a lot about. Mm -hmm. And so that's a lot to unpack. Um, but put in a simpler way, positioning, I can break it up into component pieces. And so positioning defines who my competitive alternatives are. So if folks didn't use my offering to be, you know, or use my product or my service to do what they do, uh, what would they do? So what's the alternative way of getting this job done? Um, what do I have that the alternative doesn't have? How is that valuable for customers? So what's my value proposition? Um, what, and to whom? So who is it that I'm trying to sell this thing to? Um, we, which is another way of saying it's my target customer segmentation. And then the last thing is this idea of market category. So what is the market that I intend to win? So am I, you know, uh, accounting for small businesses or am I a general ledger system? Am I email or am I chat? Am I, you know, and so this idea of what is the context that you wrap around your offering that your value makes sense to the people you're trying to explain it to. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's, it's a difficult concept because there's a lot of pieces. It, people get it really confused with, like they'll say, well, that's the same thing as messaging. And it's not. All those things are inputs into messaging. Like I can't write messaging until I know who is the message for and how, what's our value propositions, what goes into the message. And I'm trying to be better than the other folks out there, my competition. So I need, kind of need to know what they're saying and what that's all about. Um, <clears throat> and then I need to answer this question of, you know, market category, which is kind of like, what am I? So in order to do messaging, I got to have positioning first. Like people will say, oh yeah, positioning is the same thing as branding. Like, or the, like what I really hate is people come and they'll talk about brand positioning. And I'm like, I don't even know what that is. Right. Cause there's that, that's like saying apple oranges, like they're different things. You know, <laughs> there is no thing like, so, you know, you have positioning and you have branding, but again, how do I know what the brand should look like, should feel like what emotion should the brand invoke? Well, I don't know that until I know, who am I talking to and what's my value proposition and who am I? So positioning is kind of an input to all of that stuff. So it really does kind of form the foundation of almost everything we do in marketing and sales. Yeah, that's no, absolutely. And I think that's a that. piece that folks overlook or kind of clump together with messaging or with brand when really it requires quite a bit more thinking, quite a bit more research than some of those other pieces. It's way more strategic, right? It's the underpinning. And the reason we don't, the reason we get those things confused is because we are often not doing positioning deliberately. Mm. We are often just, you know, especially in, as marketers, we often just take the positioning we're given. <laughs> we, go, we come, we show up and we say, okay, you know, uh, I got market this pen, and, and, and I'll say, okay, I can market the pen. Who's it for? <laughs> I 
And why is it so great? And, when, and I'll just ask people that. And then whatever people tell me, you know, usually my boss, CEO, will say, well, it's for these people and it's for this thing. And I go, great. And then I just run off and do it. Now, here's the thing. That works great if your positioning is good. <laughs> but if your positioning is bad, now what you got is this boat anchor, right? Because your marketing execution can be perfect. But if you have a mushy definition of who it's for, a mushy definition of why you win, a confusing definition of what you are, then, then perfect marketing execution isn't going to help you. You're still going to have crummy results. So you, it's dangerous to just accept the positioning that you're given as a marketing person um, particularly if you happen to be senior and you happen to be the vice president, you pretty much never accept that. I mean, you say you accept it like this, like, uh-huh, yeah, sure, sure, that's what we do. And then you go and you figure it out for yourself because a lot of the times it's actually wrong. It's probably wrong. Or, it's right. or at least it just needs to get tightened up. Most of the time it's just, it's too loose. I still remember a way we were accounting for small businesses under 10 employees. And for the growth team, we were like, what are you? That's every business. That's like 99% of businesses. Like we are going to have right. to much <laughs> on who this thing is for and how we talk to them. So I think that's incredibly important specifically right now, because I think a lot of companies are reevaluating their positioning right. and whether or not what they, what they sell offers value in the new way the world is shaping up to be. So how do you think about messaging right now? How does positioning need to change during the downturn? Yeah, so, so here's the thing. So what happens in a downturn is, and not always, you need to figure this out, and not for every customer, but for a lot of customers, what happens is the priorities suddenly shift. So you'll have customers that had a big priority was growth. Like we just want to grow, 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 and get, you know, get more business, get more customers, get more whatever. And you're a vendor selling to that business. So you as a vendor, you're positioning yourself as, hey, we're a tool that's going to help you grow. And this is how we're going to help you grow and grow, grow, grow. Then you get something like this happen where, you know, the economy falls off a cliff. And all of a sudden that same company, and in this case, like what we're, what we're seeing in this one is it's so fast. Like I've been through downturns before, but it never happened like this. Um, so fast, all of a sudden, like within the span of a month, uh, there are a good chunk of businesses out there that have leaned back and said, you know what, man, like we can't grow right now. Like, in fact, we're actually more worried about survival and <laughs> we're worried, we would like to just sustain it, Like, and if we can sustain until this thing is over and the economy comes back, that would actually be a great goal. So if you're the vendor trying to position yourself to these companies, all of a sudden their priorities are shifted. And so you've got to adapt to make sure that you're relevant to the new priority. So, you know, I used to have a boss that, that used to talk about this all the time, but, um, but if, if you sell to businesses, in terms of value proposition, we really kind of only have two things businesses if we abstract it out all the way as to as abstract as we can get it we are either helping businesses make money or we are helping businesses save money like that's it we got like two levers <laughs> that's it we only have two things and so you know my boss used to talk about this he used to be saying we're making money we're saving money we're making money we're saving money and he used to, we used to use it as kind of a guiding principle for writing value propositions because you didn't want to abstract it out so much that you sounded like everyone else because you could, because we're either making money or saving money. So that's the first thing. There's only two things. And then the second thing is when the economy is good, makes money always works better and saves money. It's just a stronger value proposition. It's like, it's like, we're going to make you money. We're going to get you to customers. You're going to grow your business. This always sounds stronger than yeah, save a few shekels, <laughs> you know, like, like a 10% reduction in your, you know, we're going to save you 20 minutes a day. Like it just, yeah. it, this doesn't sound very, this sounds super strong. This sounds, it's weak sauce over here. Um, but then until you get something like this. 
And yeah. so all of a sudden your customer's priorities have shifted and all of a sudden their number one priority is save money, do more with less, extend my runway, you know, lower the amount of cash going out the door every month. And if you're coming in with this, you know, I'm aligned to this priority that isn't even a priority anymore, which is grow, grow, grow. Uh, I got nothing for you. Right. And so, so the positioning may have to shift because all of a sudden these folks are, they got a totally different job they're trying to get done now. They're trying to extend the runway, they're trying to extend the cash. So suddenly that alternate value proposition around this thing could help you extend and go longer sounds a lot better. Mm-hmm. So I'll give you an example. I worked at a company and we were ERP for midsize manufacturing. And this was when the downturn in, um, Great financial crisis, as we call it, uh, 2008. So 2008, market goes for a dump. Um, everything's bad. And so we had a lot of our companies were really slow. And like everyone else, our main value proposition was all around helping these mid-sized manufacturers grow. So it was all about, um, you know, how to, how to get, uh, uh, how to, how to, um, essentially expand into new customer places and how to, you know, how to add new product lines and, you know, how to basically expand the business. But we had a secondary value proposition around saving money. We just didn't talk about it because it was weak. <laughs> and, so, and so the secondary one was more, the, was more the value proposition for why you should keep us, right? So they bring us in, but the thing that actually kept you there was we actually streamlined the operations a lot and a lot of things that were manual tasks we could automate. And so you actually needed less people to do the same amount of work. And, but we didn't lead with that because it just wasn't as attractive as saying, Oh, we could do, you know, more stuff. So anyways, GFC happens, great financial crisis happens uh, and it's all, and it's all bad. And so, um, it, it, we just flipped them around. <laughs> so we had been leading with this makes money, you know, and the other one, we kind of, you know, we talked about it, save some money, whatever. And we just brought it up to the forefront and it was like, Hey, need to streamline your operations. Hey, need to do more with less. Hey, need to like, you know, figure out ways you're going to cut things. Here's how we're going to help you do it. Yeah, that's perfect. Cause I, I do think a lot of businesses are trying to figure out like, are we in the position where we need to change our messaging or do we have to, should we try to stay the course and try to survive? So what are a couple of things that are indicators that your messaging, that your positioning needs to change? Well, it's, it's really hard. Um, it's really hard to take the temperature of this without talking to customers. Like you're really going to have to figure out ways to get them on the phone and find out. The worst is if you're in SaaS businesses and, um, like you're in some kind of subscription business and you don't have um, an immediate exit ramp for customers, like they prepaid for the whole year and you won't know until the subscription comes up, whether they're going to turn. <laughs> and this is like, this should terrify everyone right now. Um, and so what you need to do is get the customers on the phone and find out how things are changing. And the conversation you want to have is really around, Hey, like, has this shifted your big business priorities? Has this, um, has this, and has it shifted it for the short term? Or yeah. are you, is it more of a longer term thing where you're trying to figure out, like, like for my clients, like I work mainly with um, tech startups and a lot of them are doing these calls now. And it's interesting the range of things they're hearing. Like, so for some parts of the economy, some folks are doing some short term things but they fully expect everything to be good later. Yeah. And so in those cases, I think you could get away with, you know, you being a vendor to them with doing some little short term things too, but your longer term positioning doesn't actually shift because it doesn't need to yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but then we have other ones, like I have a client of mine and they sell the big banks. And I'm telling you, the big banks are making resources and resourcing and budget decisions now that have a 24 month span on them. Yeah. And so if that's true, then, then you as a vendor are going to have to follow that and figure out, am I still relevant for these folks for the next two years? And, and how am I going to be? Yeah. 
Yeah. And if, and if you are struggling to, I guess, if you're struggling to make that case, then you have to look back at what your offering is and how relevant is that offering right now? Well, that's it. So you need to figure out if the, if the priorities have shifted, how does my stuff align with that? Yeah. And, and does it still? So, you know, one thing you'll get is this, uh, like the reason the underpinning of your positioning shifts is because suddenly your competition has shifted. So a lot of times, you know, especially when you're in the grow, grow, grow phase, you'll get this thing where the competition is like other vendors, right? So, uh, so you know, we could choose you or we could choose a, a more well-known vendor or a vendor that has some other whiz bang thing. But then something like this happens and you'll get the, the company is basically looking at it and saying, could we just not use this thing at all and do it in Excel? <laughs> like, maybe we could, dip it. and all of a sudden your competition is like manual labor or do nothing or do it with Microsoft Office or, and again, in order for you to get under that, you're going to have to talk to your customers to figure out what, you know, how are they feeling about it and how do they think? Yeah. Yeah. I think that so, that's kind of the conversation that I've been having over and over and over again with folks is if you think I have the answers and you haven't talked to your customers yet, I, I, my answers will be worse than the answers that you can get from your customers. So just have really good customer conversations. Don't bias them by creating a really terrible customer interview that's going to lead everyone to people please you and just say yes to everything that you ask. Um, make sure you're putting some intention yeah. behind that, but then go have those conversations. Have 20 of them this week. Right. Like as many as you can. And then, you know, and then the next thing people ask me is they'll say, well, you know, I had this, um, I, I was doing a workshop with a company last week and we were having this discussion and they sell a developer tool and it's not even just a developer tool. It's like super tech. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. It's like so techy. So it is like a developer tool with the techiest of techie techie guys. And so I'm there going, yeah, you just got to pick up the phone and talk to your customers. And they're like, <laughs> our customers don't talk on the phone. <laughs> so that's not how that works. Like, we're going to have to survey them, April. You don't understand. They only talk to computers. And, and we ended up having a long conversation about that and how you're going to have to get around that. Because yes. you're literally not smart enough to know what to put on the survey. That's no. the problem. And so... Um, and so I give them my big speech about, I had to do this once, where um, I worked for a company and we sold um, a, a database and it was for developers and it was super, super techie. <laughs> and, uh, and I was telling them my thing where I had this, I had, to, I got given this little project by my boss and I had to do a hundred customer calls. So he gave me a list of 250 customers and my goal was I had to do 100 calls, not 100 dials, 100 conversations. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and so I made a whole bunch of these calls, of course, and I'm like, hi, you know, I want to do this. Call me back. Of course, nobody yeah. calls me back. Everyone's like, no, like nothing. And so I had to perfect, um, I had to perfect my ask, right? How do I actually get these guys to get on the phone? So I went and talked to a bunch of my devs and said, like, what would I do to get you on a phone? And he's like, okay, one of my devs says, first of all, we're terrified that you're trying to sell us something. So you better say right up front that this is not a call trying to sell you something. I'm like, yeah, oh, good point. Good point. Okay, sure. I can do that. I'll tell them I'm not trying to sell something. And then he's like, and then you got to give me a reason to call you back. Like, there's got to be something in it for me. Like, what's in it for me? And so I went back to my desk and I was like, I, there isn't anything in it for you, actually. <laughs> like, like, maybe it's going to help us for me. our product or whatever. And I sat and thought, thought about that for a long time. And then I, so then, so then I decided the only way I was going to get people to talk to me is to be super pathetic. So, <laughs> so I literally did the damsel in distress call. That's what it was. I was like, Hi, I'm April. I'm new here, and they're making me do a hundred calls. And this is not a sales call. I'm just going to ask you five questions. It'll only take fifteen minutes, and please return my call because if you don't, I'm going to get fired. 
which is kind of oh, true. <laughs> and and I did a hundred calls based on that. Oh. And so then everybody had a big laugh, and then they were and the, the guys I was working with. They had a big laugh about that, and they said, "But wait, that only works if you're a girl." <laughs> like you know and we don't we don't have any women on the team because we're a tech team i'm like oh first of all get some women on the team second of all it's that's not a girl thing that's a help me out call so yeah. then i give them that because i did the exact same thing two years later we had the exact same thing and i did it with the ceo doing the calls mm -hmm. so it we we blocked off a bunch of time the ceo did the call and the ceo was like it was the help a brother out call. Yep. So it was, hey, I'm the CEO of this company. We're trying to do the right thing here. I'm not trying to sell you. I'm not a salesperson. I'm the CEO. I used to be a developer just like you. We're building this thing to help people just like you. And I need 15 minutes. I'm going to ask you four questions. It, it would mean the world to me if you call me back. And if yeah. there's anything I can do for you, I'll do like I'll owe you one after that. Yeah. And we have lots of calls on that one too. Yeah. It's, it doesn't have to be, it's not gendered. It's help. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the, <laughs> it's begging. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Although in my case on the original one, I didn't think, I, I actually do think it was fairly gendered, you know, but, um, but, it, but yeah, it was the help. Now the, the way you, the, so the, the tactic that I like the best on this to try and get your customers to talk to you is to plan in advance, right? So the plan in advance is you've got a, a, a reasonable number of customers that you have a relationship with because you've been having these calls with them regularly. And another way to call that is a customer advisory board. Yeah. So a customer advisory board is a structured way to make sure that you've always got a bunch of people that'll take your call. So if you have a customer advisory board, then you can essentially reach out to people on the advisory board and say, this is why we have you, right? I need you to advise me on what's happening right now, what's happening in your business, you know, how do we need to adjust, if at all. Um, and if you don't have a customer advisory board, now's a pretty good time to build one because part of the, part of the value proposition of having a customer advisory board is, um, is the advisory board people get to learn from each other if you get them together in a group call. And that's a valuable thing right now um, because a lot of folks in their businesses are trying to figure out how to navigate their way through this. And they're interested in hearing how everybody else is navigating through it and what's everybody doing in response and learning from that. So if you can structure the board appropriately, it's a great time to do that ask and say, look, like, you know, this is why we're assembling the advisory board, but here's what's in it for you. What's in it for you is you're going to be on a specially selected, not just anybody gets to be in this, uh, you know, board of your peers, and we're all going to work through this thing together. It's a new time to try and do it. There's a, there's a great question from the chat on this. Um, folks are asking where you recommend hosting the customer advisory board, Slack, Facebook groups. What is your tool of choice? Uh, yeah, so I've run, I've run virtual advisory boards twice previously, and we ran them, um, it was, we ran them in a, in a, in a private group. But, it, but, and back then, I don't think we would have, we would have seen Facebook as a way to do that, but you could do it in Facebook or in whatever. But both times I ran it before, we had, as a virtual thing, we had a like a private community thing set up to do that. But the but the majority of the action in the advisory board did not happen there. So the majority of the action happened on actual calls. Yeah, because in in and that was part of it was because of the kind of people that I had in the advisory board so the first time I ran one of these it was um when I was at Nortel and the people on my board were like the CIO of the New York Stock Exchange <laughs> and it's like, it's like, 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 talk in a Facebook group yeah that guy doesn't go you know participate in the slack chat <laughs> so um so we would have uh, we had two yearly face-to-face -face meetings, but then we would have a call once a quarter in between those face-to-face -face meetings. Um, now, the next one I did was a virtual was a, a virtual one, and it was for IT managers, so way lower thing, smaller businesses. 
Um, but even then, we had a we had a bit of action on the in the community, but not that much. The bulk of the value we got was on the phone calls. So in that case, we did um, individual one-on-one -on -one calls um, once a quarter, and then we also did a group call once a quarter. Yeah, I think. And, that then, we, and then the plan was if like some stuff like this went down, <laughs> we would have the emergency call and you know, you'd be able to say, whoa, emergency board meeting happening. Let's get one yeah. together. Can we get together? Okay. We've only got a few minutes left because I want to respect your time, but I want to call out to the chat and see if anyone has any questions um, for April. And I can just ask one in between, but if please. Yeah, um, you can go a little later too, if that helps, just because I know we were late getting started. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, we might go just a few minutes late for anyone who has a couple extra minutes to attend. Um, I'll ask a quick question. If anyone has questions, please stick them in the chat. All panelists and attendees select. Don't accidentally send it to like one other person because that happens all the time. Um, so one of the questions that I've been answering a lot and that people are kind of all talking about in the ether is about spend. Um, marketing spend, budgets, yeah. how to kind of think through what we all should be kind of budgeting for and spending right now, knowing that we really don't have a good lens on what's going to happen in the next three to six months. Um, what have you been, what are the conversations that you've been having look like? Well, so again, it, it kind of do, like, it super depends on your, on your situation, but so here's a, here's a handful of things I've been hearing again from the companies I'm working with and thinking about my own experience too. Um, so, uh, one thing is your business might be in that same situation where this is not looking like an awesome time for greenfield new customer account growth. And if it isn't, and you say, look, just given where we're at, and, and we don't think we can grow right now, and if that's the case, then you have to decide, is that a short-term thing? Because if it's a longer-term thing, maybe you're gonna go out of business. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, so I would hope that that's, if, if the conclusion you come to is we can't grow right now, that better be a short-term thing, and then we better all get aligned on when that ends. Yeah. Um, now, if you are in that situation where you think new account growth is impossible, it is. it may be possible that you can grow within your existing accounts and there's ways for you to do that. In which case, you might be able to shift your marketing effort or at least a portion of your marketing effort to marketing into your existing accounts because that might be easier. Um, you also might want to make sure that you're doing some stuff to, to ward off some churn. So if in the short term you can't grow, then you might, again, you might want to shift some of your marketing efforts towards giving your existing customers a big bear hug and figuring out ways that you can stop them from churning. And so you're seeing a lot of businesses out there right now doing things like allowing customers to pause their account or to degrade their account and then come back up. These things are good strategies to think about when the, if the alternative is they're going to churn on you, you really don't want them to churn because it's so hard to get them back. Um, whereas if you can do something to just keep them on in the short term, just to power through the next few months, then that's usually a good thing to do. Yeah. The second thing you've got is the vast majority of businesses that I've talked to over the last month, that's not the case. Like the case is if they look at their customer set, there's a fraction of their customer set that is in really bad shape then there's a fraction of their customer set that's actually going crazy because they're in the food business or the medical tech business or they make personal protective gear or they sell soap for gosh sakes. Like, and so they're going like crazy and there's a real opportunity for growth with these folks as long as your stuff aligns with it. And then there's the people in the middle that are you know, kind of like you, some of their business is up and some of it's down, but overall, you know, maybe they're a little soft, but it's not falling off the cliff. And, and so now is a great time for you to get a better understanding of how your customer set divides out. And is there a way for you to get really targeted in your marketing efforts so that you're really pushing hard into this segment where there is an opportunity to grow and that's where you're going to save your bacon right now. This is not the time to do generic spray and pray stuff. This is the time to get really segmented and really targeted on 
who are the people that you have a very strong value proposition for right now that are actually in a position to buy your stuff and you can you go there yeah okay awesome we've got a bunch of other questions so i'm going to try to fire through as many as i can um so tyler is asking what's the best way to determine if your positioning is working for you similar to what you said we sort of just naturally took a position based on our product versus strategically positioning ourselves yeah so you know, great, great positioning feels like magic in a way. Like it feels like people just get our stuff. <laughs> like, you know, like we go in, like if we, if we talk to people, if we pitch it to people, they just go, wow, that's amazing. I love it. Let's buy it right now. Weak positioning, the signs of weak positioning are, you know, the most common sign is it takes people a little while for the light to come on. Like mm -hmm. they're a bit like, really? why would I want that? Or really like, so you're saying you're this and you're like, no, 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 it's not that. And I got to bring you back to it again. Right? Yeah. Um, or they'll do things that they'll say, they'll compare you with something that you don't compare with at all. Like they'll say, oh yeah, I get it. You're just like Salesforce. And you're like, oh God, no, nothing like Salesforce. Like, why would you say that? Um, or there's this disconnect sometimes in like, what they think the value is, or, or even, even they get the value, but they don't get why it's relevant to them. They're like, yeah, okay, I can see why big companies would like that, but I'm a small company and I don't like that. And you're like, no, 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 here's why you like it, you know, and you have to spell every bloody little thing out. That, that's like when you get that feeling, um, and, and a lot of the times you have to actually, like if it, like my background is all B2B. And so a lot of this stuff is, hard to see in the numbers because you don't have anything to compare it to right so and it'll impact you all the way across your funnel from the people you're bringing in to the to the people that convert to the people that churn and so the only way to really figure that out is again like getting people on the phone or getting people face to face and seeing does the pitch do what the pitch needs to do and it's really hard to look at the numbers and get a feel for that because the numbers will just be all you know, <laughs> like churns not perfect and the, the conversion rates aren't perfect and we're not getting quite the customers we wish we had in the pipeline and we're not really sure why like it kind of affects you everywhere so you can't just point to one metric the positioning metric and say ah <laughs> the positioning metric is weak <laughs> okay. so you, you kind of have to judge by that if you have salespeople your salespeople know when it's weak, right? Yeah. And, and you'll know if you sit with your salespeople when they pitch yeah. and you'll see it, right? You'll see it in the, in the, in the dumb questions customers ask. You'll see it in this, you're like, you cost how much? Are you kidding? That's way too expensive. It means they don't get your value, right? It's like, oh yeah, you're just like this. No, we're not, you know, and you have to back it up and do it again. So you can feel that in, in, calls with people it's harder to measure if you're just trying to run on the metrics yeah i i used to have i used to like make my team do the customer experimentation with our value prop so like go and wait for the oh i get it like just wait for that moment where someone like the light bulb clicks for them and if yeah. you can't get it there then that's not the right value prop then you haven't your that's messaging right. isn't right yet that's right um, there's something in there that isn't like, I, I like these ones when people say, oh, you're like whatever. And you're like, whoa, what in the way I positioned this made you think I was that when I'm this, right? And getting under that, right? So yeah. I, I like having conversations with, even if you go to your existing customers and you say, you know, what, how are you solving this problem before us? Yeah. And then what happened that made you think you had to start looking at other potential solutions to this problem. And when you did decide you were going to do something different, who else did you look at? Yeah. Cause they think you're like that. Yep. And so that will give you a clue as to what mental market category do these people position you in, right? This is who they think you compare with. And then they picked you for a reason over these other competitors. Why did they pick you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so th those kind of conversations with a, with a new customer that's just signed on board will often give you a lot of insight into um, who they think you compare to and how they think you stack up and you win. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I'm going to try to do is two more questions. Okay. Are you sure. good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm good till the top of the hour. <laughs> 
So we've got one from Rochelle that's a lot that she's basically talking about how a lot of businesses are struggling with messaging fatigue right now um, because yeah. positioning for a lot of businesses is shifting towards survival and retention. So at what point does that stop being effective, that kind of survival hunker down? Uh, you, you mean like you can, you're coming at them with the value proposition of here's how we're going to help you survive? Um, that's yeah, I think that's what she's getting at. R Rochelle, correct me if I'm wrong. Is that it? I'm looking, but I don't see the. It's okay. It's a little far up <laughs> in the chat. Oh, positioning shifting towards survival. Isn't there a point where this stops being effective? Yeah, like again, it's like if it, like I think people are really sick of. Um, I think right now people are really sick of brands saying, you know, we're here for you yeah. in the time of COVID and there's nothing there. <laughs> like, like, I, think, I think everybody's sick of that. Like, I'm getting like, honestly, I'm on a mailing list that I had no clue I was on. I'm on oh. a mailing list from a coffee shop in Golden, Colorado. I'm like, how the hell did this happen? And they're sending me an email saying, we're here for you while the COVID is happening. And they're yeah. like, you're a coffee shop. <laughs> and so I, you know, I think you really got to crawl inside the heads of your customers and say, so what? Like, like, is this really relevant? Mm -hmm. And if it is, you got to make it slap. Like it's, it's got to be, you know, you know, it, it, it's not about you. It's this, the vendor. This is where all this bad messaging comes from. It's from the, the vendor is freaking out. Yeah. And like, like the, but my Colorado coffee shop is legit freaking out and I can tell, and they sent me an email to remind me that they exist and was like, you know, please buy a coffee when we're back open. And, and that has nothing to do with me. No. So they're, they're not saying we're here for you during COVID. They're saying, please be here for us when COVID is over. Yeah. And that's different. <laughs> and not that's to say not that you don't want to do that if you're the coffee shop. I think you do. Maybe filter out the Canadians before <laughs> you do that. But, but so I think there's a lot of just weak sauce messaging out there that's like, it comes across as just motherhood and apple pie because it is because there's nothing there. Now well, the flip side it's, of it's that is brands like you just you see a good as somebody as Sean pointed out in the chat you see a Toyota commercial it could easily be interchanged with a seamless commercial like you have no idea what is the specific yeah, message all, all these things you know in these trying times blah 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 it's like give me I get another I email hear, people like give me something I can use and yeah. if you don't have something I can use then just shut the heck up because <laughs> like go back and figure that out right <laughs> go yeah. back and figure that oh, out no. and don't be one of these nine million messages that I'm not going to click on because it's just not relevant because it because it's just blah 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 and so like for example this morning I had this awesome call with this company this morning and they're in Ireland and they do, uh, it's super boring. It's like, it's like compliance software for manufacturing and construction. So manufacturing construction, every, and it's mainly health and safety stuff. Like when you onboard a new employee, they got to know how to use the machine safely so they don't cut their hand off and all that kind of stuff. And so they have this system that helps for that. Yeah. So they got this genius idea and it is literally genius where, so they're in Ireland and most of their companies are in Ireland and they're about to open back up. And so they're out talking to their customers and their customers are saying, oh yeah, you know, it's the worst part about opening back up is we're legally not allowed to bring the employees back in until we comply with this new COVID stuff. And the new COVID stuff is everybody, I have to prove that my people know how to wash, wash hands properly. Ah. I have to prove that people know how to, that know how far apart they're supposed to stand or whatever. There's three things. So there was washing the hands, physical distancing, and something else. I can't remember what it was. Uh, I think it's like what you do if you're sick or something. Mm -hmm. And so, so all the, their customers are all freaking out about, how do I ensure that all the people have seen this new training? And then how do I prove to the government that they have oh, perfect use yeah. of their software, right? Perfect use. Yeah. So they show their existing customers how to do it with their software. And it's literally three clicks, click, 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 do this thing. That's how you do it with our software. And then they get this genius idea. Oh my God, anyone who's not a customer of ours 
could use it just for this one thing. So they're now running a campaign that is basically saying to anybody who's a non-customer saying, we're going to offer you a stripped down version of our platform that just does the COVID stuff. And we're going to give it to you for free. Amazing. And so that's super relevant. So you're a manufacturing plan. You're sitting there freaking out. Oh, how do I prove that everybody knows how to wash their freaking hands? And these guys are giving you a freebie way to do that. That's super relevant. They're going to get press on the thing. It's a good story. And, and it's the thing people need. And it's good business for them. It's, good. it's going to be lead gen for their big platform. And everybody gets to use it. Then it's like, you know, by the way, there's all kinds of other regulations your people have to be compliant with. And are you doing that? You can put it all on this system. And here's how you do it. Whatever. So super relevant. Makes sense in the context of COVID. Super relevant. Specific thing for their customer set. That's what we want to hear right now. Yep. <laughs> not, we're here for you, Denver coffee shop. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, you're not. You're literally oh. in Denver and I'm here and I wish I was there in Golden, Colorado, but I'm not, not likely to be there for a year, buddy. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so Scott has a really great question that I think that we should end on. So Scott asks, what is the best way to convince senior leaders that the positioning they've set out is weak? Yeah, so this is literally the hardest job in marketing. <laughs> like this is literally, if you, if you, once you figure this out, then, then you get to be a vice president because this is the hard job. So, so the, and, and um, here's how you do it. Because uh, I've done this probably more than anything else I've ever done. So uh, you can't come in like the brand. So this is me. I'm the repeat VP marketing, right? So I, I've done seven different startups where I'm the VP marketing. So I come in and after a few weeks, I know whether the positioning is good or not. Yeah. Um, but I can't walk into the CEO's office three weeks on the job, four weeks on the job and say, hey, I noticed your baby's ugly. <laughs> Right? I can't. They're going to fire me. Like, they're, they're just going to say, who the hell are you? You don't know anything about our business. I've been doing this for 15 years. And you walk in here and tell me this baby's ugly. What do you know about babies? You don't know anything about babies. And so I can't do that. So what I have to do instead is, is I got to build the case. And I got to build the case with the whole team. Yeah. Because a change in positioning is really like a change in business strategy and marketing doesn't get to make that decision on their own. So what you actually have to do, and this is, this is the way I would do it. So my, you know, my favorite thing ever is going on, is sitting on calls with the sales team anyway, right? That's how I learn everything good. So I would go to the sales team and I'd sit on a bunch of calls and every time the customer would say something like, oh, so you guys are just like Salesforce and no, we're not or whatever, whatever, after the call, I pointed out to the sales rep, I'd say, huh, that's funny. Did you hear that guy? He got all confused. He thought we were a CRM. We're not a CRM. Does that happen a lot? And after I sit on enough of those, salespeople mm -hmm. start going, yeah, I see it now. I see it. Yeah. Everyone does say that. Yeah. And so I'm hanging out and having lunch with the VP sales once a week going, I don't know, man, like I, I get a feeling there's something in the way we pitch this that is getting people confused. And I heard it on this call, this call, this call, this call, this call. Now, sales should be with me on this, yeah. right? And so if I can't get sales with me on this, then maybe I'm wrong. But if I'm right, sales, it's not gonna take me long to convince sales I'm right. Sales is seeing it every day, they just didn't know what to call it. Yeah. Right, so, so I'm like, you know, it's funny. Once we get them on board, they love our stuff like crazy. Mm -hmm. but why is it so hard to get them excited about it in the first call? I don't get it. So then you got sales on board, right? Sales has got a question mark, right? And so, so I got sales. Then I go do the same thing with customer success. And if there's a head of product, head of product knows, you go to the head of product, head of product will say, yeah, I know positioning's all bad. I told the CEO 900 times and he doesn't listen to me. And no, 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 that's usually what I get from the head of product, head of product. <laughs> They're like, yeah, good luck with that, April. Ugh. That's what I get for the head of product. And I'm like, trust me, dude, I know how to do this. So then I go to customer success. And then I, then I got everybody. And I might creep over to the dev team a little, right? And the dev team is going to be the hardest. But I might creep over to the dev a little bit. It'd be like, you know, we got this new release coming up. And we got this bunch of features. And we're trying to decide between a bunch of features what we should build and what we wouldn't. And you know what? It's funny. Because when I talk to customers that we have as customers, they think of us like this, 
But when I'm in the sales calls, I hear this other thing. And I feel like there's some stuff we could build that could close that gap. Yep. Dev, dev guys like it when you tell them they're going to fix everything. <laughs> but there's a, you could build some stuff, close the gap. So I, I literally, this would take me three months. Like, I'm not kidding you. This is not a, you know, like snap my fingers. We're going to fix this positioning stuff. No, it would take me three months to get to that. And then once I get all those people in my back pocket, then I go talk to the CEO. Then I'm into the CEO and I'm like, hey, so I'm not saying the positioning's bad. But I am saying that we got happy, happy, happy customers. And for some reason, it takes us a long time to get them there. Yeah. And that should go faster. And I'm not saying what we're doing now is wrong, but I'm saying we should look at it. Yeah. And then what does the CEO say? He says, what does Dave and sales say? I don't hear him complain about anything. I'm like, let's get Dave in here. Let's get oh, Dave in here. And then Dave, because Dave and Dave, what do you think? And then I just sit there because I've been working Dave for three months. <laughs> I let Dave say it, then yeah. Dave says, and then I'll say, you know what? I think product, same thing. You should get, get customer success in here. They see it too. It's not just me. I'm new. I don't know anything. Bring customer success in here. <laughs> so then we have the thing. Then I got to get everybody together in the room at once. And we got to work through a structured positioning process. We cannot get them all together, get them in the room and then say, let's all talk about our feelings about this. Uh, no. no, because if we do that, everybody's got an opinion. And if everyone's got an opinion, I like mine better than yours. So, yeah. so this book is literally the process I would use. Once I got everybody together, I get the team together and I'm going to work them through this step by step by step. And it's this structured process where every step builds on the next one and it takes out a lot of the people's feelings and whatever. It, it, we started a structured starting point and then we work them across. And so if I can get everyone, if I can get some, establish some credibility with the other team members, get it to the CEO, get everyone in the room, run the structured process, that's how I fix it. Amazing. I love it. <laughs> I love it. And so as a consultant, this is literally what I do now is I'm like the person that comes in from the outside to moderate that fight because yeah. it's way easier to bring someone from the outside to come do it. And that's the workshops I do, but you can easily do it yourself too. It's just, again, it's not like I'm going to snap my fingers and everyone's going to go, Oh yeah, the positioning's bad. Let's fix it. No, yeah. <laughs> it's trickier than that. You have to plant the seed. You have to inception mm -hmm. the entire yeah. organization. You got to get everybody, you got to get everybody around and then, and then you got to get everybody together to come up with it together because it's not just a change in marketing. It's a change in everything. It's a change it in impacts everybody. So everybody's got to agree. Amazing. Okay. It's two. I got to let you go. You've taken yeah. so much of your time to hang out with us. Thank you so much for being here, April. Thank you everyone for your incredible questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. But please keep an eye out. No, on ask me a question on Twitter or something. Like yeah. I'm at April Dunford on Twitter. You can find me there. You can ask me a question. She's a hilarious answer tweeter. When I get a minute. Please just follow her generally because she's a hilarious, hilarious tweeter. And obviously awesome. Is <laughs> I'm reading it while I walk the dog. I think everyone should read it. And um, next week we have Drew Dudley, a best-selling author, Wall Street Journal best-selling author, TED speaker, incredible storyteller. Um, and he's going to come talk about uh, fear, sex, and keeping people engaged on calls. So <laughs> wow. we, will, uh, we will be there next week at 1 p.m. on Wednesday, webinar.growcost.co if you want to do that. Thank you so much for everything, April. Um, this was awesome. Okay, okay. thanks everybody. Take care. Bye, everyone. <laughs>